My next guest helped get 50 people out of Afghanistan, and he says extraction should have actually been from the U.S. Embassy directly rather than the insanely chaotic way that it ended up being done by this administration. Major Glenn Ignazio is a retired special ops US Air, with U.S. Air Force and joins us now. Major, hello. So glad to have you, and thank you so much for your service. Thank you for everything that you've done for us and that part of the world and for joining us now. And your point, by the way, I have to say, actually doing the extraction from the embassy makes so much more sense than the way that this was carried out. No one said that before, honestly. I think you're the first person I've heard make that point. Yeah, you know, we've, uh, you know, I spent my time in special operations and combat rescue, and we've done these NEOs and non-combatant evacuation operations many times uh, all over the world. And usually it's out of an embassy because that's basically our, our property. And by notifying Americans of where to go, where to be, it's uh, a place that we can control, uh, not to mention losing bagroom, that was a, a big mistake. Uh, between those two, we could have made a huge difference. Yeah, and, and, and that's a really good point as well, and one that I know that uh, there's a lot of analysis going on about that because you were I mean, comparing the, the Hamid Karzai airport there in Kabul and then looking at, at Bagram. I know that that was, what, like 50 minutes from what I understand from Kabul, but still defensible. I mean, it was, you know, fortified. Uh, I, I don't know how many people you would actually need. It seems like fewer people to hold that off than the airport in a very populated area where you had terrorists all around. Why, wh why did you think they, ch they, they chose to not have the evacuation at least take place there and instead choose the very hard to defend airport there in Kabul? Okay, well, what was said was if we do it out of Bagram, we gotta put more people in to do that, which I don't understand. I mean, honestly, from a, a tactical standpoint, it makes no sense to me. Is you know, again, Bagram, we we controlled, we operated, we owned, we had our aircraft there. It was perfect. The ability to actually move from Kabul there, uh, yeah, some logistics, but it still would have been better because we controlled the entry points, we controlled the operations, we controlled the power in the airspace. So when I heard the White House saying, "Well, we'd have to put more people in to secure that area and and take care of the evacuation," that makes no sense to me because we already had it until we pulled ourselves out overnight, didn't tell anybody. And uh, like I said, it makes no sense because we already operated and already owned it. So uh, that whole mm. idea of in increasing troops to, to maintain Bagram, it's confusing. Yeah, incredibly confusing. Uh, and we're looking at some of the video of just some of the armored vehicles. And I was reading a comparison earlier of just how well armed now the Taliban are compared to all of these other NATO nations. And then there was another story just later this afternoon when I was doing my radio program that was showcasing apparently some of it's making its way to Iran. That has to be a little mm -hmm. bit concerning because that's going to bring in, I would imagine that brings in money not just for the Taliban, but also uh, I, where China comes in, Russia. I would, I mean, we're talking about like night vision scopes, things that only right. they really did give us an advantage. They're, they could easily reverse engineer this stuff. They're going to have this technology. So where does that leave us on the battlefield? Absolutely right. I, I can't agree with you more. And that's one of the things that, you know, scares me and, and bothers me. You know, I'm retired, but the operations that we did was mainly at night. We owned the night. And so the things mm -hmm. that really, yeah, really same. bother me, technology. So, you know, you're talking about Boeing Scan Eagles that were left behind. Those are those are drones that could be used for a variety of different things. Uh, the night vision technology is, is mm -hmm. huge. Those things are export controlled. We're not able to export them into different areas. And it was supposed to be the Afghan military to use them. I mean, you can see our operations, the ways that we do it, our, tac our tactics, techniques, and procedures of night operations. That scares me. And the biometric information, all that database and all the stuff that is now known of who we've interviewed or who's actually worked for us. And that's the scary part. And that's a really good point as well, because, you know, you were I, I was reading your your involvement in, in getting uh, uh, extricating 50 people out of Afghanistan. We kept hearing from, I think it was John Kirby and, and Jake Sullivan and even Jen Psaki that, well, we don't know exactly the number of Americans who are left behind. We don't know exactly the number of assets, you know, informants or interpreters, but the Taliban does. I mean, they know because they're going door to door, apparently. How is that possible? Right, exactly. You know, and, and you know, we're over 100 and we still have many, many more to go. I mean, there were thousands of people that have assisted the United States in various ways from interpreters to USAID and other things. And so over 20 years, the Taliban has been able to keep track of who these individuals are, you know, uh, monitoring, reconnaissance, everything of, of, of who, again, they are in their families. So when things went down, if they couldn't find the individual that they were looking for, say it was a special forces individual with the, the army, well, they would go after their family. 
And so there's numerous reports that we got directly from the guys on the ground that family members were killed. And a few of ones that were remaining are some of the ones that we're trying to get out right now. So the idea of, of the Taliban knowing of who they are and where they are is the scary part. So we're trying to keep them safe into different locations. And so the location is very, very sensitive. Uh, and that's one way we're trying to keep them safe now. But it's yeah. it's chaotic as how this whole thing is unfolding. There's a lot of discussion, and I've been hearing from veterans all around the country. They think that everybody, military leadership, just all across the board, everybody needs to resign for this. Your thoughts? Yeah, definitely people that are responsible in that chain of command. I mean, you know, we have thing called unlawful order. If there's an unlawful order, you don't have to follow it and you would protest it. You know, when you're talking about these things at that level from the Secretary of Defense down, you know, I understand the politics and they would be fired probably on the spot. But doing the right thing and protecting your people is important. And the other thing is, how does this actually unfold for your future? I mean, standing up and saying what I do wrong is one of the one-on-one things of leadership that we're taught in the military, being that vulnerable and accepting your errors. Okay, we have never heard that at all, even if all these mistakes that have been posted and, and actually proven that nothing, nobody has stepped up for the mistakes that have been made, including the Americans left behind. We never leave anybody behind. We have over 200. Nuts. Absolutely negligent, actually.